so jealous that you're all together and I'm not there. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying your time and enjoying the fact that you are together again. This is wonderful. Unfortunately, I'm currently in Seoul. Uh, we have a conference with UNESCO on the future of education and the arts. And I was hoping to be in Munich, but unfortunately, I couldn't get my visa. <laughs> but in any case, um, you will listen to a recorded presentation, and then I will hopefully join you for Q&A. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this year's Grand Shan. I'm very excited to be sharing my work with you, and I'm really sorry that I'm not with you in Munich. I hope you're all enjoying each other's company, and I'm glad that at least we are back to face-to-face, -face partially. Uh, so today I'll be sharing with you a bit on the politics of Arabic typography, um, two topics that are close to my heart. Um, uh, which are politics and Arabic uh, script. Um, but first, I want to start with a question that is um, uh, always uh, asked and uh, um, maybe frequently answered, but I don't think enough. And that is a question about the history of Arabic calligraphy, whether it was to decorate or to communicate. And I'll be sharing some examples with you. This is an example from the Fatimid period. And um, on the left hand side, you can see this beautiful portable mihrab, which was uh, used to pray. It's, um, it's very small in size, it's just around 20 to 30 centimeters, their sizes range. And these were uh, artifacts that were moved around with people who placed, uh, placed them in front of them and they prayed towards them du during the Fatimid period. So this is a relatively small work of art. And if we look on the right hand side, you can see coins, which are really, you know, the size of a coin, uh, a small sized artifact. And then you have a fabric, which is a tiraz on top of the coins. And on top of it is also a relatively um, a small cup, which is about 15, 10 to 15 centimeters in height. All of these objects on the left and the right are smaller in size, unlike the bands in the middle that are quite huge because they are on um, the main gate to Cairo. They were all around the gate and these are some of the surviving ones. And they were and they are inside some of the Fatimid mosques like uh, Al-Hakim Mosque in Cairo. So all of these examples are from relatively the same 200 time period under the Fatimid rules, uh, rule in Egypt um, and the region. And you'd look at this calligraphy and it's beautiful and it's royal and it's structured. Um, it's really, these are some of the finest specimens from the period of calligraphic style. But then you come to look at printed and written um, script of the same period, and this is what it looks like. It's um, it's not as ornamented, not as ornamented. It's not as uh, floriated. So you can see that utility versus decoration is becoming very clear here in these two examples. I hope at least to your eyes you can see the difference. Let's move on to other examples. Why would the Ilkhanids uh, have this beautiful calligraphy on top of this dome and the sh uh, shrine of Abd al um, where nobody can really read them that high. So obviously, it's decoration, it is speaking to the holiness of uh, uh, the religion, it is uh, communicating with the higher uh, powers. So it's not really there for us to read it. Yeah, it's at that scale, at these sizes. And again, the highly ornamental, beautiful script is evident. We move on to the Mamluk dynasty and with the Bahri and the Burji uh, Mamluks, these different examples, again, beautiful calligraphy, very decorative, part of the visual language um, 
of the period because now um, with the beginning of the gunpowder empires, you will start seeing uh, more and more unified visual languages across um, uh, the different dynasties. So with the Mamluks, they have this band of elongated script. You can see it on the building. You can see it on the glass lantern. You can see it on the uh, brass metal stick uh, on an incense burner. It's more or less the same style. But again, if we come and look at written documents from the period, they're not that calligraphed. Yeah, the, the aim was communication. And I'll go to the Ottoman Empire and show you some beautiful examples of mirrored and calligraphy on top of a very high dome that is barely visible. You can see it here on the uh, left hand side, this green circle where it's zoomed in in the second picture. This is really very up high in the dome. Nobody can read this. So why is it there again for decorative purposes and not for legibility? This is again the dome. You can see how far high and how this ayah is impossible to read with the naked eye. The only reason why now we can see this is because we have advanced cameras, but at the time nobody had eyesight that, that, that was that far and that could read that clearly. So it there is a spirituality to Arabic calligraphy that when it's used in these spaces, in these re religious spaces, it's not just to communicate with the mortals, but also to communicate with the, maybe uh, it's a prayer, it's a, it's a shielding. It's so it has, a, um, it has deeper uh, cultural meanings than just uh, a decoration of the space. It's really very linked to the culture, very linked to the religion. I show you an example of an Ottoman uh, written faramen. Again, just for the reason to, sh to show you the difference between communication and decoration for Arabic calligraphy. And now you're wondering, well, what is she driving at? This is like a really very logical uh, thing like why are we talking about it i think you have to give me my chance and wait a bit you'll know um uh, in a little bit why i'm really stressing the difference between the written and the decorative but i want to end with the safavid dynasty here and this beautiful example of sheikh lutfalla from isfahan um it's one of the most beautiful buildings i think in the history of islamic uh, architecture and when we look at this miniature uh, from the, of the Khamsa of Nizami, which was also from the same period, uh, you can see the parallels in the visual language and how this was really a royal unified visual uh, language, just like with the Mamluks, just like with the Ottomans. The Safavids also had um, a unified visual uh, branding guideline, let's call it, you know, each dynasty had its own visual elements, uh, scripts, uh, color schemes, a uh, decorative language that was very specific to that royal court. So it, it was part of communicating power, it was part of communicating um, status, uh, and it was a visual language of authority. It's not just uh, um, and patronage. So it's not just there to communicate that this is an ayah and this is a mosque or this is a signage uh, for something, but it had real um, important links to the culture and the specificity of each dynasty. So with that in mind, I want to share with you now the early examples of printed Arabic, and then we'll go back to calligraphy. So this is one of the earliest examples of printed Arabic. This was a travelogue. Um, and these are just samples of letters. They're not really uh, used to communicate. But I will share with, with you this beautiful timeline that is in our History of Arabic Graphic Design book. Um, in this beautiful timeline, I love timelines because they help me structure my ideas and then you start seeing patterns. So I want to reveal some of these patterns of uh, the history of printing Arabic in um, Europe. And then you can see, if we start looking at it, that the names of the countries that start appearing, Fano, Italy, uh, Genoa, Italy, Paris, uh, Rome, Leiden, Germany, Sweden, Medici Press. So you see all these 
Leiden, you see all of these, uh, the names of these different European capitals starting to appear. So, and then also the other thing to note is the patronage. So the different cities is very interesting. The patronage, so the French king, um, um, royal patronage, and then um, you look at um, the time when these were created and you see this beautiful evolution over almost 250 years or more of small experiments happening with the design of Arabic in the different cities. Uh, and this exchange of knowledge that is happening and the patronage, whether religious or uh, royal, so all of this, but to me, what's more important is the names of the designers or the names of the people who are spearheading these efforts. So you have the Venetian printer, you have the Orientalist bishop, you have um, a Jesuit priest, you have a French typographer, and then we have um, uh, two Maronite scholars. So all of these um, personalities are present in this history. And it's nice then to see the links between these personalities and the history of the evolution of this. I'm not going into the details because this uh, knowledge is available. I'm just interested in the pattern. And the words that I want to highlight in this uh, timeline is Arabic alphabet based on calligraphic models. And then in 1595, unsuccessful commercially. And then in 1613, again, Arabic or Turkish calligraphic specimens that were based that uh, for the basis of design. So keep this idea in mind. Most of the designers who were designing the Arabic script in Europe in the early 15th century or mid 15th century, early 16th century were uh, studying calligraphic specimens and just keep that idea in mind. So what's the conclusion? So interest in printing Arabic in Europe started in the 15th century. It was under royal and religious patronage. The aim was for missionary purpose and later for commercial ones. And knowledge on Arabic production was shared across borders in Europe. And this was interesting. And then 100 years after the first attempt in Europe, a Levantian team finally created a sustainable design module. So this is what you can roughly deduce from that. But what else we can deduce is that Arabic letters in the printing press reached the hundreds instead of this, just the 117 basic forms that are actually used for writing Arabic. So, um, and, and this is a sentence I use is that the artistic forms were burdened with beauty. So instead of the, the instead of typographers designing the 117 letters that we need to communicate, they were copying the hundreds of calligraphic forms that were used to decorate. So this, the, the printing presses were 20 times the size of type cases for Latin. And there were 1,600 compartments for Arabic letters versus around 70 for Latin ones, not to mention the length of time it took to compose. So it's only logical that Arabic would be labeled as uh, complicated to print in its early days. And I hope that this demonstrates uh, or justifies the long introduction I had comparing Arabic calligraphy to Arabic writing. Because if you go ahead and copy Arabic calligraphic forms, you're copying the impossible because Arabic calligraphic forms are based on the interpretation of the calligrapher on the page, on the layout, on the surface, on how he's feeling that morning and, and multiply that by literally millions of variations. So you can't really capture that to communicate. And, and that was the first setback we've had uh, with Arabic, with the Arabic script. Let's look at another timeline. Uh, this is the timeline of um, printing uh, in the Arab world. And you see how much later it started, yeah? 1610, these were the only. Let's look at the keywords. So monastery, 
Bishop of Damascus. And then you have Aleppo Printing Press. We have gone to Constantinople and then Lebanon. And then a Syrian Catholic goldsmith from Aleppo, Beirut, Egypt, Napoleon, Alexandria. And then you have um, um, Mas in Ula Masabki, Milano, Italy. So, <coughs> sorry. So you have all of these, uh, again, Arab capitals appearing. Um, and all of these uh, um, names of um, uh, patrons. So you have Jesuit fath fathers, Dominican monks, um, and then you start seeing more and more happening in Mosul, in Beirut, in Aleppo. So all of these, again, I'm always I'm always looking for the patterns, and I'm always interested in the patterns. I'm looking now for the names. And then we see Napoleon Muhammad Ali, Reverend Elie Smith, and Ula Al Masabki, and then Khidevi Ismail, Bishop Yusuf Matar, and then um, two Lebanese immigrants. So, and the, the thing most interesting to note for me is that between when printing started in the Arab world to when the first Quran was printed in the Arab world is almost 300 years. So to me, that's, that's a very interesting insight. So to compare, I see less names of designers and entrepreneurs and more names of patrons and missionaries. I see that we need more scholarship to find the stories of these early Arab designers. And I see that the cultural exchange between the Arab world and Europe and type was primarily for the technology. And that it, it took almost now here, I say 400 years from the beginning of printing in Arab Islamic lands before it, the first Quran was published. So I think this highlights a bit of the problems that scripts that were designed by people who were not speaking the language or were not part of the um, culture and who were businessmen, who were missionaries, who had agendas to develop these scripts. And then the technology was transferred and then we had the development. But still this main problem, this main idea that we are copy, copying the decorative calligraphy and not the legible calligraphy uh, was always the problem. Uh, because it made things slower, it made cases bigger. But then there were visionaries who came and tried to solve that problem. This, this, this is one example. I'm sure you're familiar with Yara Khouri's brilliant book on Nasri Khattar. And I'm sure you've um, either met her presenting, seen her presenting, or you have the book, I hope. If you don't, then you should have it. It's a, it's a great research. And in it, Yara highlights the journey of um, Nasri Khattar, and I think this was the first exercise where to design uh, um, a group of letters that were only for a printing press. Yes, uh, sorry, excuse me, for a type for a typewriter. So the typewriter has a very limited number of keyboards, and you had to design letters that would fit into this keyboard. And I think that exercise led him into thinking that he needs to create, you know maybe an easier way to help people read. So he designed these separated letters. But if when you read your, the book, you will discover that uh, even though Nasri Khattar had funding from the Ford Foundation, he, he got some of these printing presses into the royal court in Egypt in the 40s. Um, he worked very hard to make them mainstream, but he was aggressively fought um, by the traditionalist. And this um, reminds me of a story that I did not mention with the printing press and how long it took for the printing press to start in the Arab world was one of the, the theories is that there were too many um, scribes in Istanbul. And this was one of the main reasons that there was resistance from the traditionalist against the new technology. So 
if we look at that part of history when Nasri Khattar came with this uh, new technology, but also new idea of separating, again, there was a lot of resistance because they were worried that he was making Arabic uh, look like Latin. And even though his um, module was great for legibility and he had the science to prove it, it was not adopted by any government and it did not become mainstream in the Arab world. And thanks to Yara, we know his story. But there's another sad story I would like to, to share of failed persuasions on the history of Arabic typography. Is that one by Muhammad Said Sagar. Muhammad Said Sagar was an uh, Iraqi designer. And he also tried to solve the problem of printing Arabic, uh, decorative Arabic. And he was aware of that problem. And he even designed roots of letters. So instead of designing the whole letter and instead of designing uh, 29 letters, he designed only roots. So you, ha you only needed these basic shapes. And then when you combine these basic shapes, you'd get the rest of the letters. So he was able to really cut down um, the number of letters needed. But unfortunately, again, he uh, created lots of fonts. His fonts were adopted by major magazines in Iraq. But eventually, again, the traditionalists started spreading rumors that the scripts that he is creating look like Hebrew and that he is an agent. He was under house arrest for a whole year. He had um, a man, a policeman come to him in his house for a whole year until he eventually decided to pack and leave uh, and live in France for the rest of his life. And that was another case of failed persuasion, uh, I think, in the history of advancing Arabic typography, either because of the resistance by tradi traditionalists in that society, because they have profit agendas or they have whatever agendas, but always there is a limitation to how Arabic could have developed. And I see these parallel narratives as, you know, parallel universes. And, and I think, what if, what if these um, solutions were adopted by the mainstream? How, how would Arabic typography have reacted if, the, if these designers and their minds and their solutions uh, became part of the the visual language for the masses. What would have happened then? So it's, I guess that is a question that will remain unanswered. But to me, it's always interesting to see how uh, external technologies come into the Arab world and accordingly a recruitment process starts happening like we saw um, in the early examples to um, Levantian um, designers were able to create the first uh, script that was uh, mainstream. So uh, now we have a new technology called Letraset, and um, a lot of Arab designers are being recruited and they start designing these beautiful solutions for Letraset. And these, these are examples by Hani Al Masri and Arlet Haddad. And the reason why I have Arlet Haddad on the left hand side is, is because when I saw the work of Arlet, I was really very curious to know where she studied, who is she, why haven't I ever heard of her, and I, and I write about the history of Arab design, but I've never heard of her. So when I found this sheet, I decided to pursue the research and try to find who is Arlet Haddad and why is she not part of the story of Arabic typography in the region. And so I found Arlet and I interviewed Arlet and Arlet turned 70 last year. Uh, and she is what I call a type hermit. And she has designed, I think, some of the most exciting examples for Letra Set. But that led me to think, OK, if I don't know about Arlet, how many other Arab type designers do I not know about? And that led me to start a research on the gene genealogy of Arabic type designers. And this is the very rough beginning of, of my research. So it has a lot of gaps. It's missing a lot of data. But at least I think 
I can start somewhere with the material that I'll be sharing with you today. So I started looking um, uh, in the book, uh, in the History of Arab Graphic Design book, and I found um, a Sudanese uh, artist and designer called Waqi Allah. And Waqi Allah studied in the 40s, and actually he had um, a teacher who was British, who was called Greenlaw, and he started a school of uh, design. That it was called the Gordon Memorial College in Khurtum. And this is where Waqi Allah studied. And then uh, he moved to Egypt, Waqi Allah, and, and then he studied at the uh, School of Arts and Crafts in London. And then studied with Said Ibrahim, who's a master calligrapher in Egypt, and then moved back to Sudan. And Waqi Allah uh, started again, the, and this is from the 50s, when everybody says that the earliest Arab uh, type design uh, um, uh, courses in the Arab world were, were actually in Lebanon in the 90s, um, we have proof that actually they were in Sudan in the 50s. So it's it's an interesting, uh, it's a, to me, it's a, it was a very interesting fact to, uh, to discover because you wouldn't associate Sudan with the beginning of Arabic type design, but it is. And Waqi Allah taught Ahmed Sh uh, Shabrin who was the teacher of Tajassir Hassan, who I think some of you know, he's currently based in the UAE, and he studied at um, the London College of Art and Design, where he met Walter Tracy, who was the manager of Linotype. So now we have a Sudanese designer who comes from a lineage, and this lineage is clear, moved to London to study, and he met the manager of Linotype. And, and then, Linotype as a space became interesting for me. So a lot of this is missing. And I know there, there, there are gaps, but this is the material that I found online. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, further research is needed. But these were the list of Arabic and uh, uh, British uh, designers who were employed by Linotype to develop Arabic and develop Arabic on computers for the Arab world. So to me, again, the technology created in the West, Arab designers are finally recruited and then uh, technology is exported. So this is interesting to know. But you have the outliners and these are three examples of outliners. Ma'amun Sa'al, born in Syria, 1950s, Murad and Arlo and uh, Arlet Boutros, Murad was born in 1951. Kamal Mansour in 1953, he's from Cairo, Egypt. So we have Syria, Lebanon, Cairo, almost the same generation, uh, born in the 50s, also part of the development of Arabic and the computer. Um, and these are the names that are, you know, we were able to find, but also were, are quite productive, are still around. And some of they, Mahmoud has a PhD, Murad has published a few books. Kamal Mansour is a very well known um, um, designer. So their work is common. Uh, I still need to know the before and after for them who they studied with, who studied with them, or who was inspired by them uh, to develop. And then now the Beirut case study, and the, we have two universities that started in the 90s. You have the American University in Beirut and the Notre Dame University. And um, Leila Moussi and Samir Saer, John Kordbawi and Peter Ray, and these are some, again, these, this is all missing, but the, it's nice to see that, you know, these, the biggest group of designers are actually from Lebanon recently, in recent history. And then they would continue to study at different universities in Europe. Uh, but it's nice to see that now we have a kind of a lineage that is that is clearer than before, that at least in the past 30 now years, we can say, yes, we have a clear uh, line of designers and I'm very proud of what they are doing. And I think all the awards that they are winning and the fact that we are here with you at Grandshan and we're having this conversation to start with is, um, 
is credit to their work uh, actually because they are they were the ones who were seeking knowledge going to universities collaborating with institutions and changing the face of what arabic uh, culture looks like but then you wonder why is it that lebanon has you know all of this and i actually I have a, a bit of an excuse for why most of the type designers are Lebanese, because as you can see, between 1834, 85, 17 presses were set up in Beirut. There were 18 Arabic newspapers and magazines. So Beirut and Lebanon has a history of publishing and that creates a healthy environment for the development of designers who are concerned with layout and who are concerned with uh, type design in general. So this is this is the beginning of a research, and this is uh, many factors, as you as you saw, contribute to the creation of font. It's not just the designers or the will of the designers, but again, it's the environment who's receiving them, who's their audience, who is reading them, uh, who's who are their patrons. And I think it has been a really exciting time for Arab design, mainly because of the Arab type designers and their interest in creating uh, new fonts um, and creating a new visual language. So I hope that this highlights a bit of the politics, not necessarily all. And again, thank you very much for this kind invitation. And I wish you a great uh, um, rest of the conference. Bye-bye.